some preparation on a mandibular first molar and second bicuspid with a composite base following crown removal and tooth preparation and removal of a crown from the first molar tooth. You can see the crack, the large crack on the second bicuspid. Significant decay under the old crown on the first molar, lots of leakage. That tooth had had endodontics previously. So in these cases, we're gonna provide mandibular block and then intracellular local anesthetic with sitting this plane of the tooth that's not had the endodontics, the second bicuspid. See the crack right there. Now the tooth wasn't hypersensitive. If it had been hypersensitive, or if it had been painful to biting pressure, then I would have normally done endodontics on the tooth. Okay, this is a 330 short shank carbide burr and I'm prepping interproximally. I'm keeping the preparation into the bicuspid. Now this burr is two millimeters long and so I want my prep to be, to, I want about a millimeter and a half of occlusal reduction. So I'm placing most of the burr into the tooth as a guide for occlusal reduction. Now interproximally between the bicuspid teeth, I want to keep the burr in the bicuspid I'm prepping. I do not want to touch the adjacent tooth. I've used that same 330 carbide burr to make a cut all the way through this crown. Now this is an elevator a 39 Euphredi and you place that in the cut area and just torque it. Now if for some reason they don't torque, you don't want to break off a cusp, so what I'm doing is just making a cut right at the margin of that crown a, a bit into the tooth, but most of the cut is actually into the crown. So I've got a leverage point. And then I'm going to place that elevator in that cut and gently lift those pieces off the tooth. So most of the cut was into the gold crown. You can see all the decay on that molar tooth. So now I'm just completing my occlusal reduction with the occlusal reduction burr. And I want about a millimeter and a half of occlusal clearance. I'm, since there was decay under the crown, I want to remove all the old amalgam filling and just be sure that there's no decay under the filling. So this is the initial part of the preparation with the large round-ended tapered coarse grit burr. It's a round-ended diamond and I'm prepping just supra gingivally with that burr. And I want about a millimeter of preparation depth. Preserve all the tooth structure that you can, but be sure you have adequate reduction for your restoration. Same thing on the molar. About a millimeter to a millimeter and a half of reduction. Now I'm rounding these edges and getting rid of any decay in the body of the tooth. I'll also use a number six or eight carbide round burr in a slow speed handpiece to remove all of that decay under the crown on the molar. I'm just getting rid of all decay. This is a mosquito uh, diamond and it's very effective for interproximal uh, breakage of the contacts. When you've got teeth that I call kissing teeth and they're just right together, this is a very good burr to break that contact in the gingival aspect of the tooth. Then I'm going to come back with my flame-shaped diamond and polish those margins. Now how deep are the margins? Interproximally, I only want the margins to be about a half millimeter into the sulcus. Why? You want to be sure that you don't invade the biologic width, that you don't prep into the junctional epithelium, the connective gingival tissue. If you do, you'll have inflammation all the way around your crown and recession. You've got, so interproximally, I only want to go half a millimeter 
to be sure I've not invaded the junctional epithelium and also it makes it easier to remove the excess cement. If you prep too deep interproximally, it's very difficult to remove all the interproximal cement and that can also cause post-operative gingival problems. So keep it about a half millimeter interproximally. On the facial, I may prep a millimeter subgingival or even a millimeter and a half because you've got a the sulcus is a little bit deeper and it's easier to remove the cement. So you don't ever want to prep past the bottom, the most apical part of the sulcus. And ideally, you don't want to prep more than about halfway into the sulcus, but hardly ever do you want to prep more than about half a millimeter into the sulcus in the inner proximal parts of the teeth for the reasons I've already mentioned. So this is a medium chamfer di diamond, fine grit, and after I've used the barrel diamond for the bulk of the reduction, I'm placing my margins about a millimeter into the sulcus on the facial. Round all the line angles. You don't want any sharp line angles. You can see everything draws. Now let's talk about the amalgam filling I've left in the pulp chamber following the previous endodontics that was done 15 years ago. There's absolutely no decay adjacent to that amalgam filling. The decay was out here and out here. There wasn't any decay in the initially adjacent to that mercury filling or that amalgam filling. You'll remember in the pre-off radiograph, the, the amalgam filling extends probably three millimeters down into the canals. This is a case that good is good. <laughs> and I'm not going for perfect. In a perfect world, I might try to remove all that amalgam, remove the amalgam down the canals of the teeth, replace it with composite, but you can see we've got some bleeding issues. There's always a chance I could perforate a canal when I'm trying to remove that amalgam down into those canals. It's worked for 15 plus years. I'm going to leave it as is because I know there's no decay underneath it. So this is what I call a thoughtful procedure. This is impregnated gingival cord I'm placing that in the sulcus prior to buildup placement. This is ice cold water in a plastic bottle. I'm not using my air water syringe because I don't want any pressure to stir up bleeding again. So I'm rinsing this with ice cold water in addition to the hemostatic agent on the gingival cord just to get rid of any blood prior to buildup placement. Now etch, 38% phosphoric acid is very effective hemorrhage control. I found this out by accident. If you leave that on those areas for about 30 seconds, it will cause the bleeding areas to scab over. I'm also etching the inner part of these teeth, 15 seconds on dentin, 30 seconds to a minute on enamel. And then rinse that off again with, get a large bo plastic bottle with a spout and a pretty large hole and put ice cold water in there to rinse off the edge and then leave it wet. Just leave it wet, not soppy wet, but leave it damp when you place the primer adhesive. Remember the primer follows water it's attracted to water and it follows that the carrier which is acetone or alcohol chases the water into the dentinal tubule so if you want that dense hard hybrid layer with your composites be sure that you leave the teeth damp before placing the primer adhesive and just sop that on 
then place a two by two and blow it off with your air syringe. Now I don't want to blow the gingival tissue, I just want to blow off the, the excess primer adhesive until nothing moves. You don't want to leave a pool of primer adhesive on the teeth. You want to blow all of it off till nothing wiggles. Then always cure the primer adhesive before placement of the filled resin or the composite. And I'm going to cure that for about five seconds. Now this is a flowable composite and I'm going to place it in layers. Be sure you keep the tip of the syringe in the flowable composite so you don't trap air bubbles. Um, each layer is going to be about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half and then I'm going to cure that and continue to fill. See how the tip remains in the filled resin. Got excellent hemorrhage, hemorrhage control from the hemostatic agent and the cord and the 38% uh, phosphoric acid. There are the composite buildups are in place and I'm going to come back and prep those, blend them into the crown preparation with my chamfer and flame shaped diamonds and then I'm going to polish it with a Shofu rubber wheel. You don't have to do that but I just want to be sure I don't have any line, any sharp line angles. I'm going to check my occlusion. First I'll just have the patient bite together and check and then a very easy way to check occlusion is get some pink wax, just some normal uh, bar of pink wax which is each plate of pink wax is a millimeter thick and so I like to bend it into two thicknesses heat it in a water bath for a short period of time you can see I've got two thicknesses of pink wax have the patient bite together and any and then look for any thin areas we'll check it again And once you've done this, then uh, wash it with that ice cold water to set it up and you can see, you know, we've got a little thin area right there. So I'm going to go back and prep that. And there's a little thin area right there. Prep that just a little bit. So we've got plenty of clearance. Technicians hate it when you don't have enough clearance. They hate it when you don't have enough clearance. So be sure you've got at least, I like a millimeter and a half of clearance. Crown removal from a mandibular first molar tooth and crown preparation of a mandibular first molar and second bicuspid with composite buildup placement. And that's the Dental Minute. Thank you all so much for joining us on this week's episode of The Dental Minute. Go ahead and press subscribe right here and get excited because next week we are talking about veneer shade matching. It's going to be awesome. We'll see you next week.